At Capella University, education is as smart as the world around us. With the FlexPath format, you can take classes at your own pace, set your own deadlines, and even leverage your previous experience to move faster. Now that's smart. Learn more at capella.edu. Sugar Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran, Marvelous Marvin Hagler, and Thomas Hearns. Legends, whose four-way rivalry defined one of the greatest eras in boxing history. Relive their decade of dominance in a new Showtime sports documentary, The Kings, a four-part series now streaming on Showtime. You look around and there's these other peaks and spires, like this gra- this granite just rising up out of the trees, and it's beautiful. And you look down and there's these high mountain lakes, a phenomenal climb. Like if you're a person that's into rock climbing, go climb the Mathis Crest just for the fun of it, it just for the experience. It's it's wonderful. Hey folks, happy Monday. I'm your host, Mason Gravely, and welcome to the show. Uh, today we're talking to Jason Hardrath. He was back on he was on the show back in episode 604, talking about his 35 fastest known times at that point. Uh, and he's on the journey to 100, if you remember. And what a fastest known time is just a refresher. It is the fastest, well, it's pretty self-explanatory, the fastest known time on a mountain or on a route to to get somewhere so either you know for instance running across the grand canyon or going across and back climbing a certain mountain doing a certain trail you know every major trail has a fastest known time so the appalachian trail the the pacific crest trail continental divide all that Uh, and then it's a lot of you know multi-hour experiences they don't have to be super long experiences like a through hike they can be literally you know a a few a a few miles worth of trail Um, but it does need to be something relatively significant it can't just be like 100 yards randomly somewhere Um, so jason is leading the world right now on fastestknowntime.com with the most fkts and when we talked to him last time he had 35 fkts now he is up to 99. When we did this interview, it was a handful of months ago, and he had 94. So he's done 99, and he's getting ready to start his 100th. But get this, his 100th FKT is going to be climbing 100 peaks faster than anyone's ever done it. It's the 100 highest mountains in Washington State. You know, when you think about that state, think of all the mountains. you got the Olympic Mountains. You've got Mount Rainier itself. Uh, you've got all the North Cascades. I mean, there's just going to be, it's a ridiculous adventure. And he's doing that entire experience as his 100th FKT. Uh, and he's going to be starting June 12th. So ne- literally this upcoming weekend, I really encourage you to follow him. Uh, it's going to be at Jason Hardrath is on his Instagram. He'll be posting there. Uh, be living in his van, doing this full time while he's off for the summer. If you, if you remember, he's a teacher, so he's got a very limited time to do this. Pretty incredible. And I'm, I'm pretty excited to talk to him, excited about what's going on. But he, he's a veteran of the show at this point, so great to have him back. But before we jump in, I did want to make you aware we've got a new sponsor, Expedia. Uh, and I want to draw your attention to something that Expedia is doing. You know, a big part of adventure is obviously traveling to get there. Uh, that that's a huge logistical challenge and travel itself is is a topic on its own and lots of people are very passionate about that and so i, I want to tell you about a podcast that expedia is doing called out travel the system which is in its third season the show has a central mission to inspire and inform you about travel uh, which can mean anything from you know building your bucket list out or you know taking concrete very practical steps on your next trip on how to's how to travel more efficiently and more cost effective uh, all, all that stuff and so the show does a great job of finding people who are very passionate about travel who know a lot um, including airline pilots people who travel year round and people who are aspiring to visit every country in the world so as the world is opening up and uh, you want to look for some inspiration, definitely check out Out Travel the System. So maybe, you know, this show is inspiring you to do an adventure. Maybe that show can help you figure out where you want to take that adventure to. All right, let's get into Jason's story. All 
All right, folks, welcome to another episode of Adventure Sports Podcast. Jason, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure to to be here or to be back, depending yeah. on where you're listening. Yeah, you, you were on episode 604 for folks that know who Jason is. That was January 20th, 2020. This was this was before the whole world went to crap. Uh, this was like a couple months before and uh, almost just over a year ago. So it's great to have you back on. And I think our conversation was like a little bit before that even. So it, it's been a while. Man, that makes me almost want to go back and listen to the episode just to hear about how differently we talked about the world around us. <laughs> no kidding, yeah. That how we talked, how, how, how we knew each other, because for folks that don't know, um, you know, Jason has been involved now with Athletic Brewing and big, big time adventure on that end and uh, has been just, just kind of like how we crank out episodes here. He's been cranking out fastest known times. You are still the king of fastest known times. Uh, how, how does it feel to to be in first place, but you haven't reached your goal of a hundred FKTs yet? But how does it feel to at least kind of have that going for you? You're on top. I mean, the first time I a podcaster referred to me as the king of FKTs, it did it did put a little a little smile and a giggle. Um, you know, I was like, oh, that's that's fun, like. At the same time, I'm like super humbled by it because, you know, part of me is just like I'm just some kid from some small town out doing stuff, chasing it for the fun of it, for the love of it. And it's like I'm not some elite athlete. So it's weird to be considered like the icon of of a you know niche sport of chasing FKTs. But, yeah, no, it's fun. It's fun that it's given me privilege to speak inspiration into people's lives. I definitely enjoy enjoy and respect that opportunity. So it's it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> yeah, and I, I can already tell we're gonna have to have you back on because last time we talked, you had you you were kind of starting this huge just just media kind of rounding where you were talking to all these people about your adventures and we were just so fortunate to have you on here. You were at like I mean, I don't even know. I'm think I'm trying to a uh, thirty five, you're at thirty five FKTs. <laughs> and now Holy crap, is it totally up to date? You're at 94, correct? I am at 94 FKTs currently. Holy cow. And so for and the ultimate goal is or the next goal for for at least is to hit 100. Yep, the journey to 100 FKTs. Yeah, that's that's been what it's been referred to as. Yeah. <laughs> for the last 60, are there any that really stick out to you as just incredibly memorable or um, some of your favorites? It might be, might be hard to choose a favorite, but what, what has been kind of one of those that you're just like, okay, that was, that was something. Well, it, it's sort of like when someone asks you to pick your favorite kid, right? <laughs> right. Um, may, maybe on a different day, you, you know, you might have one kid that's a little more favorable than the other, but they all have, they all have their, their draws. They all have their unique aspects. And that's what, what I love about the, the 60 that I added to the list during 2020. As far as ones that jump out right now, there's the, the three infinities, uh, infinity loops that I did um, on Shasta, Hood, and Adams. And then I absolutely loved putting together the Yosemite picnic. Um, it was a phenomenal route. Those two, those two immediately jump out in my mind. Sea to Summit on Rainier was an amazing experience. That one's a duathlon. You bike up to the trailhead from from Saltwater, from the uh, Puget Sound, um, and then Summit the Mountain, all in a continuous push. But yeah, let's. I, I mean, any one of those we can we can kick around whichever can you want to because they're phenomenal adventures. Dude, yeah. All right. So, yeah, you you bring up the kid analogy, which we talk about a lot. But I, I, if you start having about ninety kids, I think I think some start rising to the top as your favorite. <laughs> but, uh, I've never talked to anybody with even close to that many. But no, man. And so, for folks that are listening, Jason is talking about all these adventures. These aren't just things he did. These are things he's done faster than anybody else has ever done them, which is just. Uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've known you for a while now, Jason. We've had a lot of conversations, but it's still just, it just blows my mind that, okay, like me, I could make a list of a hundred things I've done, 
my list of 100 things I've ever done wouldn't even be close to what your FKTs are. So the fact that you're not only just doing these, but doing these faster than anybody else is, is nuts. So wh- why don't you take us to the infinity loops of, uh, of those three iconic peaks, man? These are not just random mountains. These are three very well-known household name peaks in the Pacific Northwest, and you did the infinity loops of each. Um, can you take take us through one of those? What what it was like? What it takes uh, to to do? Because for folks that don't also know, you're a teacher, and so you don't have just unlimited amount of time to do these things. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I mean, I don't have unlimited time. I don't have unlimited money, but I have a huge passion for this stuff. And I mean, infinity loops for those who don't know. I think on the last episode, uh, if you tuned in with me, we talked about mm-hmm. the Rainier Infinity Loop uh, quite a bit because that was a a big breakthrough of my 2019 Um, and that having completed and broken the record on the Rainier infinity loop set the tone for me to then look at the other two mountains at that time, Adams and hood, which already had established infinity loop records. And I wanted, I wanted to attempt to be, you know, hold all three at the same time. So I was very motivated to, to make it happen as soon as possible and then Shasta is my like backyard mountain, my training mountain. I'm a, I'm a guide on, on that mountain. And it just felt authentic to go ahead and uh, be the first person to put an infinity loop on that mountain. Um, so I started with that one. And over a course of three weeks, I did three infinity loops. And an infinity loop, as I was starting to say, is when you climb up one side of the mountain on a route, descend the opposite side roughly, um, on a different route down to the, the trailhead. And then you do a half circumnavigation around the mountain, um, either on a trail or off trail or on roadways, um, depending on what mountain you're at, um, de- will determine whether there's a trail to go around or not. Hood, for example, has a beautiful circumnavigation trail, uh, called the Timberline. Um, Adams has a trail uh, about half of the distance and the other half is just completely brutal off trail. Um, and Shasta has a network of old forest roads and then also a brutal off trail section through volcanic boulders. Um, so you do this half circumnav, you go up and over the mountain again, and then you complete, you finish it off by doing the final portion of the circumnavigation. So in the end, you've gone over the mountain twice and you've gone completely around the mountain. And I think what I fell in love with about those experiences is just being able to see every aspect of the mountain during the circumnavigation, seeing every face, every aspect, and then also experiencing what it's like to go up and down on, on opposing sides of the mountain and the, the different views you have as you do that. To me, it's a, it's a really remarkable experience to have with a volcano. I guess we could jump into, into one particular one or which, which direction would you like to go? What do you want to know more about Mason? What I'd love to know is, is I just love that idea of infinity loop because, it, you know, so many people are pretty content with going up and down a mountain, just getting, you know, getting to the summit and coming down. I don't always feel that way. I'm like, you know, I don't need to, I don't necessarily need to summit something to get to know it. But the whole goal of going out there is to get to know the the place, the mountain, the forest, the get to know the location. and it And it feels like, your goal out there with infinity loops is not just to summit it, but it's it's more than that. It's not say I, Jason, got to the top. It's I, Jason, got to know this place, and you can you can see it in a obviously from a totally different perspective than just the summit here. You know, I agree. I mean, one of the things that that's so powerful about these experiences is you take, you know, people people set aside you know, three day weekend to climb one of these peaks. Um, People set aside, you know, three and four day intervals to backpack around these mountains. And so these experiences are things people normally carve out large chunks of time over potentially multiple years to to go out and experience, to climb multiple routes on a mountain, to, to hike around a mountain. So it's like, each aspect of what you're going to do is a worthy goal in and of itself. And to go out and have an experience that puts all of that into a single push 
to me, as a person that loves the challenge of pushing my body in, in a beautiful space to face the challenge, it, the challenges that space has to present for me. Yeah, it's a super cool experience. And you come away and you feel like I've packed weeks or years of human experience with this place in today's or a day. That's what's so that's got to be the high is like the concentration of the experience uh, being essentially what would be months or weeks of someone else's experience packed into mere hours. Um, that has to be part of the draw of FKTs to you. Okay, could, could, let, let me ask you this. For folks that would say, hey, you're going through these places too fast. You're not a, really getting to experience them. What would you say to them? I mean, kind of my my gut feeling is, as I've said before on other podcasts, and I may have even said this, on the last time I was chatting with you is, is this feeling that it's like, no, because I'm, I'm not just doing it to check it off the list and then be done with that space or another space. Um, it's not like I'm only going to climb it once and then go home forever. So to go out and do all of this in a single push, you know, to, to have done a, you know, two summits and a circumnavigation of Shasta on one weekend and two summits and a circumnavigation of hood on the next weekend and two summits and a circumnavigation of Adams on the next weekend. Like those experiences to, to me, it's like obvious that I'm out there experiencing more, not less. And I don't know, there's a part of me that's like, you know, I can always come back and do it slower, but my personal experience with being in the outdoors, I actually, I derive a huge amount of my outdoor experience, like the, the full spectrum of the experience from the sensations of pushing my body in that space. Um, so like I think of I think of the hood infinity loop and one of the amazing parts of that infinity loop is you climb a, a really steep, somewhat technical route for your ascent route up the mountain, up the Cooper Spur. I mean, to some like dedicated climbers, that's a super easy route. Um, but to a lot of, you know, general level climbers, that's a that's a hard, scary route. And then you descend on the south side, the traditional route that most people climb when you hear them talk about climbing hood. But you get to look forward to climbing that twice in different conditions because at some point you're going to have to climb that route either in the heat of day or the cold of night. And those are two very different experiences on that type of snow and terrain. And I mean, the circumnavigation trail on that mountain is just wonderful. People, people, I don't even know how many thousands of people hike around, run around, backpack around um, that 40 mile trail, the Timberline Trail in a given year. Um, but it's a really high number. Um, and so you're out there experiencing all of that. You're out there in that space and crossing these other people who are out doing their own version of amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, that to me, that to me is a, a beautiful part of the experience. How do you decide what to go after next? Because f for what you do and, you know, say you could just do infinity loops forever. In, in, essentially, like I'm going to go do those, that concept here, 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 and just, just chase that all around the country. Um, how do you prioritize what you want to do and then start systematically going after it? That's a great question. I I do love sort of seeing the for lack of a better term, like the archetypes, the structures that exist out there. Infinity loops is a structure. Uh, picnic triathlons, you know, that's a structure. Sea to summit is a structure, like a sea to summit duathlon is a structure. And going, okay, what is another beautiful place um, that this style can be applied where it will also be aesthetic and beautiful and classic and others will want to repeat it? Um, so that that's a huge amount of goes into the picture of how I make my decisions um, I don't just want to do the same thing because a, a reason I took on this 100 FKT project was I wanted to grow as an athlete. I wanted to expand like to to chase 100 FKTs. I, I sort of knew the game would get harder to play as I played it, you know, because other people are going to be breaking records, too. I'm not the only one. Um, so the game gets harder to play as I play it. So that means I'm going to have to get better and wider. Uh, more expansive as an outdoorsman, as an athlete, in order to continue progressing toward my goal. And so I also choose things that along with being aesthetically drawn to them and knowing therefore other people are aesthetically drawn to them, whether I'm the one 
putting up the route or following someone else's route. Along with that is this element of like, oh, what new challenge is held here for me? What new thing can I face? And you know, something that comes to mind is I've put up uh, some semi-technical and technical canyon loops um, in, and added them into the, the FKT niche. Um, and you know, canyoneering is normally something done pretty slowly. Um, but like, to me, I saw it through this lens of those are nature's obstacle courses. And there's also this element of like having enough nuanced understanding of the canyons to know this one's unsafe to put people in. Like this is not a canyon you attempt to race through quickly. Um, and then what is a canyon that is like fits this criteria of like, okay, someone could come here and push themselves hard. And yes, there's risk. There's always inherent risk in sport, but it's reasonable and also classic enough. Like it's within that reasonable and like a classic enough, like people regard it highly enough that it, it should be something people show up and who love to push themselves, like be able to see it as, okay, I want to go and try to take the FKT on this Canyon loop. And so I was not a canyoneer at all um, prior to this 100 FKT project. And now I have this, you know, skill set and this, you know, mind and this eye for, for canyons in, in a way that I would have never, likely would never have happened if I didn't take on this sort of bigger overarching umbrella project. Um, and that's one of the, one of the ways I make my decision as well. It's like, what's going to grow me? What am I going to have to become better in order to complete? Hmm. What what has been the I don't know the playing field of competition been in the last year since we've talked, uh, in the sense of other people going after a hundred or trying to surpass you, or, or or do you feel that, you know, I don't want you to have to sound cocky or something, but do you feel like you have a comfortable lead? <laughs> oh goodness. Um. So looking at twenty twenty, I mean, with races getting uh, shut down, FKT sort of became a craze, like. They're talked about way more. More people are aware of what they are. More people are competing at them. More people are attempting to put up their own routes and putting up their own routes. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a huge surge in the the FKT niche of you know from the mountaineering community, from the especially from the running community with races being shut down um, from from a variety of places have kind of come flooding in to get that spirit of competition, that taste of competition that so many of us have a hankering for and yeah fkt's became the premier space to do that and it's been fun fun to see sort of some of the creative elements that have been able to come into the world too you know more more movies and videos in these beautiful spaces that fkt's are done that maybe there wasn't the attention or the money for that because people were busy you know focusing on you know this or that race event or this or that you know climbing event so it's been cool to see that happen i'd say that's a positive outcome of of 2020 but yeah as far as I, i've seen let's let's rewind a bit so the last time we talked coming into 2020 after the 2019 year the season if you will i believe i had broken the record for the most fkts in the year and i'd only done like 24 that year and that was that was more than anyone had ever had done in a year but then i i don't know if you know i can't claim that that had influence over how other people viewed fkts um like maybe Previously, people thought, oh, you do one or two a year. Right. Um, and now like that going, well, no, you can do lots in a year. You can do two per month, um, kind of change the mindset. Or maybe it just would have happened anyways, where someone, you know, these people who are doing lots of them would have done it anyways. But yeah, there's been, I think somebody in 2020, there were a couple of guys that did 34 and 36 um, oh, wow. FKTs, uh, David Bone in the UK has been rattling them off. He's, he's, he's uh, crushing it at the start of this year. Just in January alone, I think he's done eight or nine, maybe 10 now. Um, so he's, he's going wild with some of the short trail systems that they have over there, um, putting out these, these pretty awesome one, two, three. I think some of his long ones are six or seven hours, um, but just like rattling them out like crazy. Um, and he was having a really strong year with that in 2020 as well. There's a guy on the East Coast, uh, Justin uh, Kowalski. I probably butchered his last name. So, Justin, if you're listening to this, I apologize. Um, he rattled out some East Coast trails, um, like 34 different FKTs or 32 or something. 
there's someone who did 29 FKTs in the Colorado area. That was pretty impressive because a lot of them were, you know, uh, peaks there that had pretty solid times um, to, to beat. And he rattled off that many. Um, so, yeah, the game has changed. Like the frequency and intensity that people are going at these things. Um, just a whole different world, like a whole different world than um, 2019. Yeah. And when we talk 2020, because what happened right after then? The freaking pandemic, man. And then all these people who had all these goals for 2020, which is like, it's so aesthetically a uh, an important year, like 2020. It's it's just, it, it, it for mar- it's so marketable that people were like if psychologically ready for a big year for themselves. And because this happened, it's like they put all that energy and all that training they had done into somewhere that it was still possible to compete and that was through fastest known time you you didn't have to just go trail run and, and be done you could use the power of social media the power of the internet and say i did this in this amount of time let's see who else can do it in this amount of time or less and so it, it, it was just great timing for you to be kind of the one kind of lead in the charge uh statistically speaking that's pretty cool no it's been it's been a, a cool place to be in. I mean, with my students as a teacher, I I always like to say you're preparing for opportunities that you can't see yet. And Mm. because I started chasing down this path of, of doing as many of, for me, it's about these memories I'm creating and these experiences and the growth. But because I was already doing that in 2019, like I'd already accumulated uh, a bunch of FKTs. People were already kind of like looking at me as someone that you know, knew how to create routes and, and knew how to, how to perform in these, uh, you know, whether it's run plus free solo on, on easy, moderate rock climbing or, you know, out in the mountains on glaciers. Um, like they were seeing me out doing this stuff. That's like kind of big and hard. And I was already kind of, you know, known that way just because of the Rainier infinity loop and the cascade trifecta and the Oregon's five highest efforts. So then as this, as people came flooding in, it was, it was interesting to like have people sort of looking at me as someone who knew what they were doing, even though I was fairly new to FKTs myself, having only done my first one in 2018. So yeah, it was, it was a huge growth curve, a huge learning curve. And I, I, I I took it both as an honor and kind of a responsibility to like, okay, what is, what is the culture here? What's the right way to go about doing these things? Because, I mean, anytime you have a huge influx to your community, oftentimes some of the the nuanced things that made the community strong can get watered down by this influx of people sort of bringing their own habits and bringing their own you know thoughts and beliefs about how things are done, which is great. I mean, fresh thinking is good, but not when it's at the cost of the best of what a community was creating. So, yeah, it was really interesting to be suddenly in this position where here I am talking on multiple podcasts in a given year about FKTs and what they are and how to do them. And it was an honor, but also like, Ooh, I don't want to say the wrong thing um, because I've come to know Peter and Buzz who founded, you know, coined FKT. And it's like, well, I don't want to like have them be like, well, that's not really the spirit of it. (laughs) Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, One of the things I'm really impressed by that I think goes unnoticed with a lot of these is not the actual achievement, but it's, 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 it's the circumstances in which you need to get to the place and come back. Like, I know that sounds, you know, lame or cheesy, but I'm blown away by like the driving times and the commitment and the lack of sleep that you endure to get to where you need to go to do some of these trips. Is that something that takes more of a toll than, than folks realize, or is it something you happily do? Let's go with both. Okay. Um, I mean, as soon as you mentioned happily, I, I've i spent years of my life, and I mean, part of having these experiences in the outdoors is that process of learning to thrive in the face of difficulty, in the face of unfav- unfavorable conditions and setbacks and extreme cold or pain or sleep deprivation, right? That's a part of these experiences. And I've been doing this for a lot more of my life than just my FKT career, if you want to call it that. And so it's easy for me to happily want to dedicate myself to an effort 
that's going to be taxing and draining because I've spent my whole life embedding this fundamental belief that everything worth doing is on the other side of discomfort and building a practice around that being sort of a fundamental tenet that it's like, if I want to live an interesting life, if I want to do things that are beyond ordinary, there is going to be discomfort and not just like embracing it in sort of a begrudging way, but embracing it on a level of this is a part of the experience. Therefore it is what I want with the experience. It, you know, I don't, I don't want to try to get by with as little pain and as little, I mean, even though we do optimize, especially with an FKT to be as efficient as possible, but I'm not looking for the easy path because the easy path is just sitting at home on the couch watching Netflix or so it seems until later in life when you, you know, if someone handed you a book and forced you to read the story of your own life where you'd go, holy crap, this is boring. Like that, that, that would be sort of the, the negative outcome down the road. The pain would happen later. Um, but embracing that pain here and now because, and like almost appreciating the discomfort and the difficulty because it's like, well, that's part of what makes this worth living is that I am facing this. And so, yeah, I, I think I do still, I would say I'm still happy in the face of, oh, I'm going to drive 17 hours and sleep for a few hours and do a 13 hour push rim to rim to rim across the Grand Canyon on a trail system that doesn't have a, um, a bridge. So you have to swim through the cold water in a snowstorm. And then I'm going to bike out from that trailhead because part of the road is closed to vehicles and bike out in that snow to get back to where I'm going to drive <laughs> another 17 hours to get home. And then I'm going to go back to work the next day. Um, <laughs> it, that it's amazing. It, like I'm willing to embrace that and almost to the point it makes me smile. Like, <laughs> um, but also it's like that took a toll. Like I did 60 FKTs and not every one of them was, you know, a 13 or a, a 24 hour effort. A good chunk of them were infinity loops and um, C to summit efforts and picnics that were big, high effort undertakings. Some of them were like shorter sprint technical Canyon efforts, but still like the driving time and the sleep deprivation. Like when you're averaging over an FKT per week for an entire year, I definitely was running ragged. Like I, I was pretty beat up for a lot of the year to keep churning out. Um, especially when I was doing the longer efforts kind of back to back to back, like the three infinity loops in a row, I was super passionate to do it that way. And it kind of broke some of my training rules, uh, for doing FKTs, um, in high frequency. Cause normally I don't put that many big efforts back to back to back with, you know, 50 plus miles of movement and, 20,000 plus feet of elevation gain. Like I normally wouldn't allow myself to do that back to back, but that was part of the experience I wanted because there was something very personal about holding all of those infinity loop records at the same time that was very desirable to me. So I was willing to kind of yard sale out a little bit further than I would normally allow myself to go. But I spent a good chunk after that kind of, kind of going ragged for a while, just like waiting for the body to come back around. It's like it's not it's not rocket science, you know. It, it's you immensely want to do this. You don't have necessarily some sort of cheat code in life. It's just <laughs> you drive for seventeen hours <laughs> to make it happen, man. I mean, when I when I open up the radius around me, that seventeen hours out, and I have three days to make something happen. If I really wanted to for a weekend, it's like, geez, the whole freaking world opens up. You know what I mean? It, it's not like, oh, I've got to, you know, wait till I, I, I build up this amount of time off and do something. The more comfort you add into it, the, the farther away it seems to get and the more money it takes. But with the way you're doing things, it's like you 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 are you are getting it done. Yeah, you're going to be tired. Yeah, it's going to be tough. But it's really about this way that you're looking at it. That's so amazing to me. And uh, I, I don't know. I don't keep it just, I'm just kind of going on and on here, but it's like, you're just turning something that a lot of people would say, Oh, I don't want to do that. I want the experience, but I don't want to have to get there that way. And you're putting a smile on your face about it. I think that's a huge strength of yours, a huge 
um, ability. Honestly, that's that's to me part of your part of your expertise is that right there, that attitude and that perspective. I don't know if I don't know if you feel that way about it. I think. I mean, that almost takes me back to my childhood beliefs about myself, right? I mean, I kind of perceive myself as an underdog, and I've talked about this before, but when you have an underdog belief about yourself, this fundamental belief that it's like the only way I will ever do accomplish anything of interest is if I put in way more work than anyone else. Like, otherwise, I'm just not even going to make, like, you know, I think of myself as a young athlete. Like, I knew I would never go to state if I didn't train year round. There were other people on my team who could come really close, just like showing up on the first day of track with zero training. Like they were just talented enough to do that, but I wasn't that guy. Like I could look at what I was currently producing, um, in race times. It's like, I've got to, I've got to train and get way faster in the off season. If I'm going to make this next jump to this next level, even semi successfully. And so I think that taught me this, this sort of willingness to endure any amount of effort any amount of perceived resistance or perceived pain, if I could see progress toward the goal. And, you know, it's sort of a different, like most people have a, a pretty low bar. Like if it gets beyond this difficult or, you know, this many hours of driving or whatever, you know, rubric you want to fill in there. It's like, if it gets beyond this, then it's not worth it. And, you know, my equation for that is, you know, it can be unlimited amounts of effort, but if you still, if it's still possible and you see progress, you go. And so I think that carried over into my approach where it's like, okay, yeah, I have hard limits on the lifestyle I can live. Cause I do have to work for my living. I'm not, you know, some trust fund baby, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, making money from nothing. I wasn't born into riches. Like I have to work for my money. I have, I have a job that I do love. I do love my job and it does afford me a ton of time off, but it's a, it's a job that has hard limits on the days you have to show up as a teacher. There's not really much flexibility to just be like, I'm going to be gone this day. Um, because you have to book a sub and put in extra plans and it disrupts your classroom. And it's more work most of the time to, to yeah, take off. it's, <laughs> it's, it, it can be pretty, pretty intense to take a day off. So, and you're only, you know, you're only allowed a very limited amount of days off as a teacher. Cause they're like, you get your summers off, you get spring break, Christmas break, you don't, you don't need very many personal days or sick days during a given year. And then it's also kind of looked down on when you do use those in kind of a subtle, like cultural sense. So that kind of limits, right? That creates hard limits. So there are things that are impossible for me to do. Like I can't just, you know, unless someone was willing to like pay for a private jet for me, which hasn't happened yet. Uh, like I can't go do things on an international scale in a, you know, two day or a three day weekend. Um, so I am kind of limited to a certain window, but I'm willing to push that window out to where I've had efforts I've done where I didn't even like make it back on Sunday night. I, I literally rolled up to the school the morning I was arriving for work on Monday from the long drive back from an effort because it's like, well, those are acceptable hours to utilize, you know, like sleep for one or two hours on the road so that I can still be a decent teacher during the day and, you know, drive all through the night other than that to get back to school on, on Monday. And that's, that just strikes me as totally acceptable and totally reasonable. And what you have to do if you want to live an interesting life, if you will. And I mean, what do I know? I'm just some gym teacher, but there you go. <laughs> mm. Imagining you rolling up to your school parking lot, you know, bloodshot eyes after doing some amazing trip and you river bathed to get cleaned up. And and you just show up and start teaching these kids. I mean, you've got in the back of your mind, like, I got away with this amazing thing. And it's almost like it's yours, you know? It's your little, not a little secret, not that it's a bad thing, but it's, you can talk to somebody about your weekend and, and be just, yeah, it was a good weekend. And leave it at that and just, just walk <laughs> away with a grin on your face. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. Worried about mom or dad falling? The Symphony Medical Alert System from CVS Health helps make their home safer, even if you can't be there. Symphony works with voice activation or a care button they can opt to wear, along with smart sensors for coverage around the home. With 24-7 emergency response and an app to tie it all together, you can monitor your loved one's well-being for enhanced peace of mind. 
Terms and conditions apply. Learn more about Symphony at cvs.com slash symphony or find it at your nearest CVS Health Hub. Discount Tire has just made tire shopping easier. Their touchless experience allows you to buy tires and book your appointment online. Then when you drive in, you can stay safely inside your car as the tires are installed. Discount Tire. Let's get you taken care of. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Yeah, no. And it is it is that way. Absolutely. Where it's like nobody really knows like I'll I'll make. Oh, yeah, I went to a mountain or I went and did this. Um, Sometimes, you know, the, they'll be like, wait, you went all the way to Death Valley. That's like eight hours, nine hours away. Oh, yeah. You know, I wanted to do a thing there. Um, So sometimes they get like little pieces of the puzzle, but I don't think anybody really knows like what this weekend road warrior life is is like. Um, but yeah, no, I, you know, some people might be like, oh, you know, that's compromising your teaching. No, I think actually, cause I could, I, you know, I obviously then sleep more during the rest of the week to kind of recover, but the sense of pride and the sense of belief in living life to the fullest that I come back to on, uh, on Monday for my students, I think that probably broadcasts a stronger message for, for what I teach. You know, I'm a health and PE teacher. Uh, the enthusiasm I have for my own life, like makes it easy to be excited for creating meaningful experiences for them. Um, as opposed to if I just played it safe and was like, oh, I'm going to you know, stay at home and you know not do anything. I don't think I'd be the same teacher because I'd be a different person. And I, I would never want to downplay someone who makes long-term healthy decisions like sleeping right and eating right and, you know, not exercising too much, which is, you know, there, there are studies out there that show various forms of overexertion with the body and sleep deprivation do have negative long-term outcomes. So like I've thought about that, I've pondered that, but to me, the story I seem driven to live, the passion I have embedded down inside me, the drive I have for getting out and doing things, it, to my story, from my story, it seems more authentic for who I'm supposed to be in the world to live the way I'm living. And I think someone can be a fabulous, you know, you know, let's even put them in the same category as me, health and PE teacher, who is just like, literally, I exercise the right amount, I sleep the right amount, I eat the right way. Like that's, that's modeling something beautiful too. But yeah, you bring up like the person who's just partying, and then coming in ragged, like kids are gonna pick up that it's like, you're not really into this. Um, But a huge part of my message to my students is you, you can dream big. You can do big things. Yeah, it's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to be hard. There's going to be huge setbacks. You're going to have to be uncomfortable to make those things happen because that's true for me. Um, but also, I've done amazing things, and I'm just some kid from some small town, um, and here I am teaching in a small town. So it's, it, to me, it's like the two go hand in hand where it's like I see myself as a certain person. I live a certain way in the face of that, and then it gives me permission to say to speak these truths or wisdoms into my students' lives where it wouldn't feel authentic to be like, yeah, you can go trace, chase big dreams. And, you know, whether you want to be an artist or a you know mountain climber or whatever, if you're willing to put in the time and effort, you will see fruits for your labor. Like it wouldn't make sense to say that and then live a life where I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not going to go chase uh, rim to rim to rim all because it's a 17 hour drive. And that's just, that's just too much. I, I better play it safe. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, words of wisdom, Jason. I, I know we always get off on like a philosophy tangent. Every time I talk to you, it just goes into the why, then it then it, then it balloons from there. Um, if you don't mind, I'd love to bring it back. We I know we talked about infinity loops before, uh, but can you tell us about this this interesting thing? I always see you writing about it, and I want I want listeners to know what is the picnic concept that you do and the one that you were talking about before the yosemite picnic can you go into that a little bit like you did with the Uh, infinity loops i would love to (laughs) um so the yosemite picnic and anytime you hear the word picnic in the outdoor sense where it doesn't seem to apply to sitting on a blanket with a wicker basket and some sandwiches and you can kind of tell like this person's not talking about that what they're probably referring to is a form of triathlon that's sort of the outdoor enthusiast triathlon where you bike to a given destination, swim across a given body of water, do some kind of mountain objective or climbing objective, 
and then swim back across that body of water and bike back to your starting point, usually a town or a logical like starting finishing point. Um, the first one of these uh, created was the Grand Teton picnic. And uh, it started from Jackson. You biked out to Jenny Lake, swam across the lake, summited the Grand Teton, and then reversed it all back to town to finish. Um, and I loved, I loved the stories that came from that. I loved the, the just human powered nature of it. And so I became very enamored with the idea. Like they hadn't been in the FKT world, even though times are kept on them. Um, they, they hadn't been on the, the FKT website formally. And I was like, oh man, I want to put some of these up. So I did a Shasta picnic, um, which, you know, again, my backyard mountain, and there were just some it, it, it wasn't a bike first one because the lake is right next to town. So it made more sense swim, then bike up to the trailhead, then summit the mountain. So a more traditional triathlon format. But the Yosemite picnic, I mean, you can imagine. So you're standing right under El Cap at the, the bridge, the El Cap bridge. And that's, that's your starting point. And, you know, El Cap is just this beautiful piece of rock that you, you can't believe how much you have to strain your neck backwards to just keep looking up and up this vertical wall. Anyone that's watched free solo or Don wall, you've come to understand a bit of its grandeur, but in person it's, it's, if you haven't seen it in person, it's more than what you expect. I'll just put it that way. So you're staring up at this granite monolith, craning your neck backwards. You're, you're getting ready to click into your, your bike. You know, you have 43 miles of riding with well over 3,000 feet of uphill to climb your way up to uh, Tenaya Lake in Tuolumne Meadows, up to Tenaya Lake in Tuolumne Meadows. From El Cap, like the from, El Cap from, Bridge or Meadow? Yep, the El Cap Bridge there uh, <laughs> next to the meadow, right under El Cap. It made a nice, clean starting finishing point for someone pedaling a bike. That is an epic um, route, man. That is awesome. So, yeah. And, you know, so you start off in the dark because you there's elements of this that you don't you, like. You don't want to be descending that road in the dark. So you start with the dark at the front end. Um, also, the reason that's wise is you avoid all the the traffic um, while you're moving slow on the uphill climb. Um, so that mitigates because I've had people be like, oh, isn't that kind of risky? Like, that seems like the crux riding that road. It's like, well, you're riding at such an early hour of the morning. We only got passed by one car. Um, I did this with a, a buddy who was interested in doing something like this, a multi-sport experience in Yosemite. So we we created it together. Yeah, we got passed by one car because we're you're biking through the darkness, which is also kind of friendly when you have that much climbing to do that you don't really notice how much you have left to go or how much you've put behind you. You just kind of like, well, I'm riding. So, I'm so just what turning time the are you talking here starting? I, uh, I forget if we did like a 3 a.m. or a 4 a.m. start. Oh, There's geez. been a few FKTs since then. Oh, um, but an early start, we basically timed it. So we would arrive at our first swim at Tanaya Lake as sunrise was happening. So there'd be good light for the swim and it ended up working out pretty well. So anyways, again, back into the story, you've, you've biked up all this distance into Tuolumne Meadows. The sunrise has happened with beautiful views. You, you kind of get into, after all this climbing, you kind of get into some rollers where you get to like rage a little bit faster on the bike um, with some downhills and even get into like some deep tucks to um, push the speed up and cut the time. And you roll up to Tile Lake, you switch into your wetsuit because it's a cold water, you know, nearly at 10,000 feet in elevation lake. And I mean, that lake by itself is a lake. I've come to find out that people who are swimmers, who are open water swimmers, it's like a, you know, bucket list check off lake to swim across like they'd go to yosemite to swim that lake um so you charge right through the middle of this lake um from the west shore to the east shore which is the the lengthwise of the lake it's about a 1.1 1.2 mile swim um just one of the most beautiful swims i've ever been on I've, i you, you can just imagine you're just you know you're churning with your front crawl and you, when you turn to breathe on one side, it's like you see these granite monoliths and granite walls around you. And then you turn to breathe on the other side. And there's these granite domes and, you know, trees and the high alpine setting. And it's just like, yeah, the air is thin up here. But wow, what a view. Like easy to sight because you've got so many uh, 
landmarks to to guide yourself by. Um, you don't even have to cite straightforward like you normally would, um, because you can just look to your side and be like, yep, that's in the right spot. So I'm swimming the right direction. <laughs> so you you charge through the middle of Tanaya Lake and you get to the the sandy beach on the other side and you pull out and you're a little bit cold and you're like, okay, time to peel the wetsuit off. And transition, we we did self-supported. So your gear's there kind of waiting for you under a tree. And you switch out to the the running shoes, and if you choose to bring them, the climbing shoes, and have those stashed away in your running pack. And you immediately start charging up uh, Tanaya Peak, which is this kind of easy, moderate, 5'4", I believe is what it goes at, uh, slab climb. And it's steep, it's exposed. Like if you have a fear of heights, it's definitely triggering that because you're just charging up this buttress that comes down and it's pretty low angle. So, I mean, a lot of it, an experienced climber might even still just have their hands on their knees, but someone not experienced with exposure would be like, you know, hands down on the ground, kind of, kind of scared. Cause you charge up 1500 vertical feet, um, up this, up this slab, like a this sheer slab. slab. I'm looking at it. It's just, it's just straight. Yeah. It's pretty phenomenal. It's like, really consistent steepness for a really long time. And then there's a few harder moves up at the top. If you take the most direct route that maybe you're like five, six, uh, depending on how you go, maybe five, seven. Um, but there's ways to keep it easier as well. Um, and you charge up to that summit and now you're, now you're, you know, 1500, 1600 feet above the lake you just swam across and you're looking down and you're like, Whoa, we charged right through the middle of that. That's a pretty big lake. Um, <laughs> And that's peak one of the day. And you take off running kind of directly away from the lake toward what's called Mathis Crest. And it's called Mathis Crest because it's this mile long razor ridge. And I mean like a, a true razor ridge where it drops away for hundreds of feet on either side of you. And sometimes the the top of it that you're grabbing onto is basically the thickness of a broom handle. And you're just kind of working your way along this thing. And the hardest moves of that one go go at 5.7, which is decently hard as far as easy moderates go if someone's not a, an experienced climber. Like a lot of people wouldn't be comfortable climbing that off a rope. And I definitely had to take multiple trips out to Yosemite just to be sure I was confident and safe and had mentally rehearsed and memorized all of the moves and the route uh, that I would be taking to to complete the Mathis Crest. Um, so it's like, this isn't an effort that you just willy nilly show up to go do. And that's one of the beautiful parts to it is there's this element of projecting brought into, uh, the world of triathlon and the world of ultra endurance, which doesn't, you know, some big races, like if somebody's going to race UTMB, they might take the time to go out and run a few of the major climbs to, to know what was coming. But the projecting mentality is not really much a part of the triathlon or the ultra running world because you just show up and do your race and go home. But it's beautiful to see something that's super common in the rock climbing world. I mean, people in the rock climbing world will revisit the same project for decades of their life sometimes before they finally see it through to the finish. Um, so it's cool to see some of that projecting mentality. Like I'm going to show up multiple times until I know this space so well that I'm comfortable to do this big effort that takes a day. Um, so anyways, on the Mathis Crest, just drop offs on either side, like definitely triggering your fear response if it hasn't already. And you're doing this for a mile, a, a horizontal mile, not to mention all the vertical distance that you cover um, up and down as you're working on the different features of this crest. And you're up climbing, down climbing, and you're just working your way across this. And after you complete this math, just, and like you look around and there's these other peaks and spires, like this gra this granite just rising up out of the trees. And it's beautiful. And you look down and there's these high mountain lakes, a phenomenal climb. Like if you're a person that's into rock climbing, go climb the Mathis Crest just for the fun of it, it just for the experience. It's, it's wonderful. Um, you complete the Mathis Crest, the full Mathis Crest, and you drop off and then climb up over a saddle between the Echo Peaks and drop down. And then your final peak of the day of what's called the Tuolumne Triple Crown, which by itself is an iconic like rock climbing achievement for Tuolumne Meadow to have done the Tuolumne Triple Crown in a day is a cool like rock climbing achievement. 
And so this is, the, you know, the third thing you're doing that day is this, you know, trifecta of rock climbing for the, you know, Tuolumne Meadow. And so then you're going up what's called Cathedral Peak, which is about 800 feet of consistent five, six rock climbing that goes between cracks and flake features and just nubbins, airy nubbin moves where you, you know, nubbins are like just these, just like they sound little, little round things that stick out of the rock and you're like stepping on it with your toes and grabbing with your fingers. And, you know, there's at some points, you know, 700 feet of air down below you. And it's fairly mild, mild angle, but there's a few spots where you feel super exposed. Um, so you're just like looking around you and again, the world's just like falling away and there's these lakes and there's these peaks and these mountains. And then you make your way to, through the final moves to the summit of that peak. And it's basically the size of your dining room table on top. It's not very big and the world just falls away on every side and like by itself, beautiful experience. Again, a classic climb by itself of, of Tuolumne Meadow, uh, Tuolumne Meadow of Yosemite. And then you descend off the backside and run down toward the cathedral lakes and run down a giant slab system to reconnect with the trail. And you run back to that lake where your wetsuit is stored. And again, you like, you know, you're feeling like the cramping come on a bit and you're like, oh man, this swim is going to be interesting charging right through the middle of a lake. And you already have all these, you know, foot miles, all this rock climbing, all this biking. The previous swim is all, you know, it's on the ledger. Like you've already, you've already written a pretty big check for the day and you're like, okay, here we go second time through the lake and you're like battling the the leg cramps and you're like well you know this is how swimmers can end up dying um so i definitely recommend some like having some form of a a person unless you're a very experienced swimmer having some kind of a person on a paddleboard or a kayak who's there in case stuff goes sideways and you charge through this beautiful swim again and then then the super fun part <laughs> you get to hop on the bike and bike another 40 plus miles, but this time with over 3,000 feet of descent. And you just get to rail on it going at the speed of traffic a lot of times, uh, which is why when, you know, again, people say like, oh, that roadway is unsafe. It's like, well, in the morning, not many cars out yet. And when you're going back down in the afternoon, evening, you're charging down so much downhill and the speed limits are lower in the national parks where if you're a good cyclist, you're going as fast as the cars sometimes. And so you charge all the way back down to the Yosemite Valley and you're just, you're, you're surging down the hill, deep tuck, you know, popping up to pedal a little bit, going back in the deep tuck, um, just, you know, leaning into the corners. It's this beautiful flowy, you know, occasionally the roadway is a little bumpy right now. I hope they get that asphalt repaired soon and you get down to the valley and it flattens out for this last like three mile push, two mile push. And that, that gets pretty hard. Cause you have, you know, when you, when all said and done, you've basically covered a hundred miles when you add all of the distances together. And so you're surging and you kind of see El Cap off in the distance. And of course it's such a big monolith that it's like, why haven't I gotten any closer? Um, <laughs> so you're just pedaling at it and pedaling at it and you round the corner and you stop the time as you surge across the bridge and you're just staring right at El Cap as you finish. And yeah, phenomenal experience. I mean, I'm following you on a map as you talk and I I happen to just absolute like Yosemite is, is the place that I love more than anything in the world. And uh, man, to, to, to see, to see some of those most iconic places and get up in the in the high country where a lot of people never even in venture to a lot of the visitors, and to also get to experience the valley, um, and one experience all done by your own power is that that had to be just an unreal experience. Oh my gosh, were were you crunched for time with with setting the FKT or or were you actually setting it there? We were the first two to ever do it. Um, and I mean, a huge amount of reverence and thought went into every little decision about how the route would go. Like we chose to start at that El Cap bridge. Originally we were like wrestling, like, oh, should you bike the whole Valley loop? Cause the whole Valley loop is such a beautiful place. But then there was this like wrestling in our mind. Like, it's like, you know, where else are we going to find as distinct of a starting finishing point? And also do we want to subject people to the risk while trying to race on a bike against time 
of the traffic and distracted tourist drivers who are staring up at the monoliths and the granite and the waterfalls for the first time and all the people walking around and darting across the roadways in different places where the trails are. Um, do we really want to subject a future person to that amount of risk? Um, and we decided against it, even though it's like, oh, you don't, you don't really get to have a view of say half dome while you're doing this effort because you go, don't go all the way into the valley riding that loop that people like to go in and drive. But we just, we just weighed it. It's like, ah, there's too much risk where someone's going to get hurt. Or at some point, like when the record is, you know, lowered to the point that people are breaking it by mere seconds, like people are going to do unsafe things for others or hit a tourist or whatever it might be. Um, so we're like, let's keep it out where there's, you know, nobody's blowing through any stop signs. Um, and L cap is such a significant feature that that L cap bridge position totally made sense. And like the swim was obvious. Like I mentioned before, that's an iconic lake and the Tuolumne triple crown was obvious. It is like possibly the easy, moderate link up, you know, run plus, uh, easy or excuse me, hard scrambling, easy, moderate soloing, uh, in the world potentially. So like those decisions were super easy. Those two, those two things are super classic. And one of the cool like bits of positive feedback that I got after creating this route was uh, Hans Florian, the guy who literally wrote the book on speed climbing on the nose. Um, he looked at it and he went, damn, why didn't I think of that? And I was like, yes, he <laughs> likes it. It's <laughs> a validation and, right there. Yeah, when someone with that much background about speed and the valley, and he's done FKTs as well. Um, he held like the California 14ers record for a while. And, you know, someone that's done done that amount of stuff and has that amount of miles under their belt uh, to, to be not just satisfied, but impressed by what you created. It felt really cool to to add something meaningful to a space that has like a history of pushing the limits and, and being at the fringes and edges of human endeavor in outdoor sport. Um, so yeah, uh, it's definitely an effort I'm very proud of. I'm excited to see what other people will do on it in the future. Um, you know, it has yet to see someone do it completely unsupported, carrying all their gear start to finish. Um, I think we did it in a self-supported style. Um, yeah, because we did our we left our caches behind um, ahead of time so that we could do all our own transitions. Um, somebody could do it in a supported effort with a, a crew, you know, carrying all their their gear and needs for them. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of open potential there for for what can be done. Um, but one thing I like about it is even if someone is like Iron Man championship shape, like they just won Kona. They can't just show up and one off this effort because very few people who do triathlon are also avid mountaineers and rock climbers, and especially to the degree that they're willing to go out and solo rock routes. So it's it's something that someone has to have the will and the love of the place and the dedication to go out there and rehearse the moves and understand the the connections and the link ups and and the climbing routes of the Tuolumne Meadow. Um, so they they have the privilege and the and have to have the discipline to go out into this beautiful space and have multiple experiences before they get to put the final finished product together. Um, and I don't know, that feels like a proper amount of reverence for such a beautiful space that to design a route that someone can't just be like, Oh yeah, I've got, I've got 15 minutes. I'll go do it really quick. Um, that to me is, that to me is cool. And is one of the things that makes the route feel significant. Um, even though like one of the, the friend that I did it with Ryan Tetz, somebody was like, Oh, like, why did you make the bike so long? Uh, it's like, well, we didn't, we weren't out to make this, the easiest triathlon you could do in Yosemite. Right. Um, we right. wanted to make this the multi-sport experience of Yosemite. Um. <laughs> wow. And, you know, 
half of it is some pretty awesome downhill <laughs> or nearly no half. joke but the the other half is pretty pretty tough climbing with not a lot of shoulder so uh it's just so crazy when you really start thinking about everything it took to to do any of these fkts it's you really begin to appreciate just what you're doing here and how you're doing it and what you're growing uh, you know that you it, making aware to so many people of these sports because any one of these could be a pretty cool experience that people are very very proud of and you're just cranking them out at this rate that it's almost like to it to the average person when you tell them what you're doing you just almost have to gloss over it like oh cool and then move on in conversation and in thought but when you really start thinking about it and really pour into just one and then times that by 94 it's pretty wild so i want to ask because actually we probably will need to start wrapping up now that you're at 94 and the goal is 100, I'll try not to lead too much with this, but <laughs> what what is your plan for the next handful of FKTs? What are you what are you able to share, I guess? Great question and very respectfully phrased. Thank you. Um so as far as the next uh, you know, 95 number 95 through number 99, um, I'll follow the same process that's made me so successful at what I've done um, in that I have over 160 routes still in a notebook that are at least partially planned out that have um, either to be created that have a huge aesthetic draw to them or to beat someone else's time where the you know analysis of the paces, um, whether it's vertical ascent rate or, or running speed, uh, there's potential for me to beat the standing time. And I'll just watch the weather windows and make my play when the weather window in a given area, you know, like you alluded to, when you're willing to go, you know, 16 or 17 hours in any direction, you can kind of track, you know, big weather patterns and and conditions in different places and go, oh, I could go to Utah or okay, I can go go to Northern California or Washington. So I'll, I'll follow that same process that's been working for me for producing so many um, efforts to, to do the next few, but the, I'm breaking form a little bit with my hundredth where I'm setting my intention toward a very particular route that has sort of jumped out and I don't know, grabbed my, grabbed my mind and my heart a bit. Um, there's just something poetic about attempting 100 peaks for my 100th FKT. And uh, it's the 100 peaks of the Washington Bulgers list. And it's a beautiful route, a super remote route. Like, I don't worry about saying it so much. At first, I was worried about sharing it just because like, oh, well, if I say it out loud, then is somebody going to try to go out there and beat me to it? Um, And that's always the fear with FKTs anymore. Again, like there used to be a part of the culture where it's like if someone says they're going to do something, you don't go out and, and sniper them on it. You don't go snipe it from, from under them. But again, with the huge influx of new people, like some of that culture has gotten washed out where, you know, you, you kind of, okay, you have your, you, you've made your call. You've said you're going to go do it. So I'm going to let you have the time to create what you're going to create on it. And then I'll go beat you after because you called, you know, first dibs or whatever. Um, that's kind of, I mean, it's some people still kind of behave in that way, but others don't, they'll like hear that you want to do something and go, well, I mean, you're faster than me anyway. So I went ahead and went and did it. So that's fine. Right. Right. Um, which, you know, sure. Okay. Take, take what you can get. Um, but it seems a little less honorable than the opposite. Um, so I, I try to, if someone says they're interested in something, I try to give them ample time to attempt it. And if it turns out, it seems like, you know, like a, a year goes by and they haven't made an attempt or been able to put it together yet. It's like, okay, I mean, I've given you ample time at some point. It's like, I just need to go out and do this thing if I want to do it. But I always communicate with that person first, like, Hey, so, you know, I'm interested in this too. Da, 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 da. Are you going to go for it? Do you have plans to actually go for it? And I mean, if they're like, well, I know, I don't know. I can't make, and I'm not sure I can make it happen. Then it's like, okay, well, I'm going to go for it. But if they're like, oh no, I'm going to go on this day. It's like, all right, I'm going to hold off just because that seems like the right way to me. Circle back around. Uh, the Washington Bulgers is a list of the hundred highest peaks 
of the state of Washington. There are peaks that are extremely remote, like you have to go out 25 plus miles just to get to the first one. Um, there are peaks you have to access by boat or are most easily accessed by boat. There are peaks that um, it, it makes the most sense logistically to enter at one end and exit at an alternate end. You have to uh, cross over an international border to get to some of the peaks because you have to kind of go up into Canada and then come back into the USA on a different road, um, a different route, and then access the peaks from that trailhead. Um, so there's all these logistics that go into these hundred peaks and it just, it feels like a, a beautiful final examination. Cause it's, it's going to test my logistical ability to a degree that it's never been tested. It's going to go right to the limits of the climbing I like to do in the Alpine setting. As far as rock, it's going to have glacier travel, which been, which has been a part of things like the Rainier infinity loop and some others. So it's like this, this test of all these skills that I've accumulated, but it's going to be this continuous big push that's sort of maxing out every skill set that I know I have um, and just doing it on back-to-back -back days. And it's an experience and a route where I've had to lean into a whole community of people I would have never met. Um, the, the Washington Bulgers completion list, like the people who have actually completed all 100 and to be able to like reach out to that community and have them get stoked on what I'm doing. Also concerned, right? Like mountaineers are a conservative bunch when it comes to like putting out route data and, you know, talking about the, the mountains, unless they sense that you're a person that's not going to go out and get yourself killed, which is, that's what they should be, right? These are dangerous routes. People do die out there. They fall into crevasses. The, the, the rock breaks loose on them because they weren't paying enough attention to the quality of the rock they were on or they get off route and get lost. Like these are easy places to get lost. These are easy places to end up in a crevasse. These are easy places to get injured while rock climbing. So that, you know, understandably they're hesitant, especially initially until kind of, I was able to tell some of my story and establish that, you know, I do want to like honor and respect this route and, and other people's experiences and I, my hope is to sort of be the first person who's put a true don't go home until you're done push um, in a supported fashion where I'd have, you know, a person, a driver who could pick me up at opposite ends of a mountain range and like show what can be done on these mountains with that sort of approach um, because that hasn't been done yet. So it feels like a cool contribution to that community. Um, it's cool to have some people rallying behind me and helping me build the maps and talking about their climbs. Oh, well, I went up this side or that side or down climbed here, or you might want to not do this, do this instead. Oh, don't go down that valley. It's the worst bushwhack you'll ever face in your life. Just all sorts of information. Um, yeah, it's, it's been amazing. I've learned so much about the state of Washington that I didn't know. And what's kind of crazy to me to kind of circle back to what started our conversation, I'm going to go from having been to a few places in the state of Washington, you know, Mount Rainier and Adams and St. Helens and Ocean Shores, Washington, where I started my bike ride across the USA and uh, Spokane, like a few different places across the state. I'm going to go from a limited knowledge to over the course of my hope, less than a hundred days, I will have a more intimate knowledge of the backcountry roads and the backcountry routes and the hundred tallest peaks than most people who live in the state their entire life. And that's pretty radical to think about. And it's, it's, it's weird because it's like, I will be a different person on the other side of that, right? Like I'm not going to be the same Jason Hardrath at the other end of this hundred peak experience. Right. And that's cool to think about too. It sounds like a perfect way to finish what you're doing, honestly, which is awesome. And we're going to be excited to follow along that. I know that we're working together a little bit on that through Athletic Brewing. And I'm, we haven't thought about it or not thought about, worked on it much over the winter, but it's, it's, it's going to start ramping up here and it's going to be pretty phenomenal. I can't wait. <laughs> I am definitely excited to tell some cool stories through it. First of all, 
thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. Sugar Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran, Marvelous Marvin Hagler, and Thomas Hearns. Legends, whose four-way rivalry defined one of the greatest eras in boxing history. Relive their decade of dominance in a new Showtime sports documentary, The Kings, a four-part series now streaming on Showtime. Nobody builds 5G like Verizon builds 5G. Because we're the engineers who built the most reliable network in America. And the more you do with 5G, the more building it right matters. The more your network matters. The more Verizon engineers going the extra mile matters. It's us pushing us. It's Verizon versus Verizon. 5G built right from America's most reliable network. Most reliable based on rankings from Metrics second half 2020 U.S. report of three mobile networks. Results may vary. Award is not an endorsement.